good morning and welcome from First Baptist Church. We appreciate you joining us from home today. And we very much look forward to seeing some of you in person here next Sunday morning. I do want to remind you that uh, we will continue to provide the service through our live stream for those of you who are unable to attend or who are not yet comfortable uh, attending in person. So uh, you'll still be able to watch the service uh, from your home uh, next Sunday and in the weeks ahead. Uh, I do want to say to those of you who are planning to be with us next Sunday, we want that to be a joyful reunion as we come back together. Uh, but of course, we also want that to be a safe environment. We want to be responsible. So let's all please do our part in helping to protect one another. Uh, we're going to ask when you come into the sanctuary and are seated that uh, you try to sit in every other pew or every other row in the balcony. So there should be an empty pew or an empty row both in front of you and in behind you. Uh, behind you. And then also, of course, uh, make sure you keep uh, distance and space, adequate space uh, beside you as well. So again, we just want to do everything we can to protect one another and be respectful of one another. Uh, as I mentioned on the video that was sent out last week, uh, we know that this will be different for us and there will be things that we can't do that we normally do, uh, but we also want to be thankful for all the things that we can do and we want to be thankful for the opportunity we have to be together again as God's people. I also want to let you know that we will be having uh, VBS at home. So for those of you with children, uh, you'll have the opportunity to participate in VBS from home starting on Sunday night, June the 14th. And you can find out more information about that and register online at our website, fbcjackson.org. Well, today we join with Christians all around the world in celebrating Pentecost Sunday. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and so we uh, celebrate uh, Pentecost, and we have much to celebrate on this Pentecost Sunday. Of course, we celebrate uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the sending of God's Spirit to us, who dwells within us and who teaches us and who helps us and shapes us more into the image of of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also celebrate the multi-ethnic and multilingual makeup of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, how the church is made up of people from every language, every nation, every tribe. And so that reminds us of uh, the commission that Christ has given to us to go and take his gospel to every nation, tribe, and tongue. And so uh, we think of our missionary partners serving all around the world, and we think of our part in fulfilling the Great Commission. But sadly, we also are reminded of uh, the racism uh, that still exists in our world, and especially here in our own nation. So even as we think about God's love for all the peoples, all the races and nations of the world, we uh, see the effects of prejudice uh, here in our own country. We've seen that in recent years and months and especially these last few days with the death of George Floyd and all that has come since then. Uh, so on this Pentecost Sunday, I want us to begin our time of worship uh, by praying together. So if you will, there in your homes, uh, bow your heads and join me as we pray. I want us to begin our prayers this morning simply expressing our grief and our lament to God over the prejudice that still plagues our nation. And let me ask you to pray in particular for our brothers and sisters of color who have faced so much injustice in our nation. Now give thanks to God for his great love for all peoples, for all races, for all nations, tribes, and tongues, and ask that God would fill us, his people, with that same kind of love.
Pray that God would continue to spread his name and his gospel to every nation, tribe, and tongue, and pray for our missionary partners who are seeking to do just that. Pray that we as a church would continue to be committed to taking the gospel across the street, across town, across our country, and across the globe. Now give thanks for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and give thanks for all the ways in which the Spirit is at work in you and at work in in our church. O Spirit of the living God, would you fall fresh on us again this morning, on this Pentecost Sunday? Would you revive us again and fill each heart with your love? Might each soul be rekindled with fire from above? Would you draw our attention to and make us more like our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, now let's hear the word of the Lord as it reminds us of the events of the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. I invite you to please open up your Bibles and follow along with me as I read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are all filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in these last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire 
and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Let us pray. 
Father, we thank you for the blessings with which you have blessed us. You've made us a prosperous nation, a wealthy people. And we know that you have done that for your own purposes. I pray that you will be pleased with our tithes, our offerings. I pray that we will give them with a sacrificial heart. And we pray especially this morning on Pentecost Sunday that you would use these gifts to proclaim the good news of your grace to all nations, that many, many more would come to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our Old Testament reading this morning comes out of the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. It's the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, even on the male and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The the sun shall turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. If you would, please take this moment to confess your sins. Let's pray. Almighty God, we urgently need you to wake us up from the lull of sin and rebellion in our lives. We have become relaxed and comfortable with our sins. We have become so overwhelmed and concerned with the cares of this world and failed to raise our hearts and minds to you, awaking us this morning to the reality of our sins. God, you are holy and just, and we are unholy and unjust. We are unrighteous. We love self more than you. We love wrong more than right. Lord, your day of judgment is coming, and there is only one way we sinful people can be reconciled to you. You sent your son, Jesus, who lived the perfect life we could not live. He died on the cross for our sins. We owe a debt to God because of our sins. We deserve eternal punishment and hell for our sins. But on the cross, Christ himself took our place, bore our sins, and suffered the wrath of God that we deserve. He extinguished it. He put it away. In his death, he secured the ultimate resurrection and renewal for us. And those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved from sin and death. And when we confess and repent of our sins to you, you forgive us and cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. Because of Christ, may our sins be remembered no more. Our assurance of pardon this morning comes out of Romans chapter 8, verses 13 through 14. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who have led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. times we have failed you 
Selfish in thought and uncaring in deed, foolish in word and ungrateful. Spirit of God, conquer our hearts with love that flows from forgiveness. Cause us to yield and return to the mercy of God. Merciful God, O oh, abounding with your fatherly heart, growing our faith with each testing. God, speed the day, struggles will end, faultless will gaze on your glory. Then we will stand overwhelmed I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. And let us hear the word of the Lord together this morning. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will marvel to see the beast, because it was, and is not, and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, One is, the other has not yet come, 
and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eight, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are of one mind and hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those, who with, those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw? They and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. A warning and a reminder. A warning and a reminder. That's what Revelation chapter 17 provides us with. And so that's what I want us to see together as we look at Revelation 17. A warning and a reminder. I want us to start with the warning, and that's actually where we will spend the majority of our time together, with this warning. Revelation 17 seeks to warn us about Babylon. And as I've mentioned before, Babylon at least for John's original readers, symbolically stands for Rome, for the city of Rome. But of course, it's not just Rome. It transcends Rome. It stands for the city of man in general. It's fallen, sinful human culture in any century, in any geography. It's a symbol of the idolatrous world that stands in rebellion against God. That's Babylon. And the way that Babylon is described here is meant to serve as a warning to us. Have you ever heard the saying, appearances can be deceiving? Or there's more than meets the eye? Or people are not always what they seem? Well, those sayings certainly apply to Babylon, who is here in this chapter personified as a woman. And John wants us to see this woman for who she really is, because she is not as she appears to be. In fact, one commentator said that this chapter works like a fairy tale in which the magic of the beautiful seductress wears off. And when it wears off, it reveals a hideous and evil witch. He said this chapter works like a fairy tale in which the magic of the beautiful seductress wears off to reveal a hideous and evil witch. So be warned. She's not what she seems. Don't be deceived. Don't be led astray by her. See her for who she really is. So look at what we read about her in verses 1 and 2. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth 
have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. So Babylon is described as a great prostitute, the great prostitute, signifying her spiritual adultery, her spiritual infidelity, her spiritual unfaithfulness, her idolatry. That's what it's getting at when it calls her a prostitute. It's getting at her idolatrous ways. And we're told that this great prostitute is seated on many waters, which is interpreted for us at the end of the chapter in verse 15 as the waters representing peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So these many waters that she sits on are symbolic for the many peoples, many nations, many languages and multitudes that she reigns over. In other words, she has universal appeal. She has a worldwide following. She reigns over many peoples and nations. That's why verse 2 says that the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her. That is, they have joined her in her idolatry. They have joined her in her rebellion against God. They have been seduced by her, and they have therefore therefore joined with her in her spiritual adultery. And the dwellers on earth, the end of verse 2 says, that is, unbelievers, remember when Revelation uses that language, the dwellers on earth or those who dwell on the earth, it's always referring to unbelievers. So the unbelievers of the world, they too have become intoxicated with her and with her idolatrous ways. And we can begin to see why that's the case when we keep reading in the following verses. So look at verses 3 through 5. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. Now, this woman, again, which represents Rome, but not just Rome, represents all of fallen, sinful human culture. That's why she's uh, the mother of prostitutes. It's not just this one identification, but being identified all throughout the world. Here she is holding this cup that is full of abominations and impurities, we're told. And yet, she gets people to drink it. She gets the kings of the world to drink it. She gets people from all over the world to drink what she has in this cup. How? How is she able to get them to get drunk on her concoction that she has brewed up. How is it that she seduces them in this way? Well, she's enticing. She doesn't look like an evil witch. She looks like a beautiful woman. That's why in verse 4, she's dressed in beautiful clothing. She's decked out with expensive jewelry, all of which speaks to her wealth and her majesty and her beauty and her splendor. She's wearing purple and scarlet. She's adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. She displays all the glitz and all the glamour that our fallen nature craves and adores and admires. She represents cultural achievement and economic prosperity and social influence, all the things that seem to captivate us and appeal to us. I mean, think about the way that first century people thought about Rome. And and that's the way that she is appearing. She seems glorious. She seems impressive. She, She glitters. She gleams. And they are enamored with her. 
And not only that, notice she's powerful. She's powerful. Verse 3 tells us that she rides on a scarlet beast. A scarlet beast who is full of blasphemous names and has seven heads and ten horns. Now this, of course, is the same beast that we saw rising out of the sea back in chapter 13. This is the beast that stands for the persecuting power, the persecuting power of totalitarian governments. The beast represents military might and strength. It represents the ability to violently enforce and impose its way. So this woman has aligned herself with the beast. The fact that she sits on the beast, that the beast carries her, points to their alliance. It points to the fact that they are working together, and they're quite the pair. Her seductive influence and his power to coerce, make quite the dynamic duo. She entices, she seduces, she corrupts, and when she can't seduce, when she can't get people's attention, well then you've got the beast who has the power to come behind and force people to be enticed with her, to force people to follow her, because if they don't, then the beast will put them to the sword. The beast will put them to death. And that's why so many of the kings of the earth and dwellers on the earth are under her sway, are intoxicated by her, are caught up by her lies and her deceit. And that's why we read what we read in verse 6. And I saw the woman, verse 6 says, drunk with the blood of the saints the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Those who refuse to be influenced by her, to be seduced by her, who refuse to buy into her deception, are persecuted and they are put to death. So she is seen here in verse 6 as being drunk, but being drunk on the blood of the saints, on all those who refuse to say Caesar is Lord, but would only confess Jesus is Lord. And at this point, John is shaken by what he sees. He is visibly affected by this vision. That's why he says what he says there at the end of verse 6, when he says, when I saw her, I marveled greatly. He is visibly affected by this because, remember, he was told in verse 1 that he was going to be shown her judgment. He was going to be shown her downfall. But what he sees instead looks like the growth of her influence, the growth of her power. It looks like she might be unstoppable, teamed up with the beast. And so the angel says to John, Don't marvel at this. Don't marvel at this. Let me tell you how this is going to play out. Look at verse 7. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. So first, we're going to get some insight into this beast that she rides on, that carries her. Look at what we read in verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, they will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Now this echoes exactly what we saw of the beast back in chapter 13, in that the beast mimics and counterfeits the Lord and his resurrection from the dead. That's why he's described as he was, he is not, and yet he is to come. So the beast is going to give the appearance that it was, then it wasn't, 
and then it rises again. And this is why the dwellers on the earth are going to be so captivated by it, why they're going to be amazed by the beast. Now, I mentioned back in chapter 13 what I think this points to and what I think this is symbolizing. I think the best way to understand this description of the beast as it, it was, it was not, and then it was again, it, it rising again, I, I think all of this is meant to communicate the fact that the beast keeps manifesting itself all throughout history. Evil empires keep popping up. Every time it looks like evil is finally defeated, some new dictator rises on the scene. That's why the beast is said to have many heads. As soon as you cut off one head and think that the battle's done, then it seems as if the beast begins to attack with another of its heads. And so that's why people seem enamored by it, by its power, because it always seems to keep popping up. But remember, the beast manifests itself in real ways, in, in real places, in real rulers and real empires. And we see that in verse 9. Verse 9 says, This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads of the beast are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Now, this is clearly a reference to Rome, to the city of Rome, which was famous and well known for the fact that it sat on seven hills or seven mountains. That's what the city of Rome was known for. Just as uh, if you said the Windy City, you knew uh, someone would be talking about Chicago. If you hear somebody call New York the Big Apple, you, you know exactly what they're referring to. Rome was known as the city on seven hills or the city on seven mountains. So for John's original readers, when they read this, they would know exactly what it was referring to. They were to see the beast and its heads embodied in the Roman Empire. But of course, it's not only limited to Rome and the Roman Empire. Rome was just the embodiment of the beast in the first century. It had other embodiments before, and it will have plenty after. So look at verses 10 and 11. They are also, the seven heads, are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, and it, it is an eight, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. Now, my guess is that that is crystal clear to all of you, and so I don't really need to spend much time explaining that at all. We can just skip right on to verse 12. No. These are some of the most difficult verses in all of Revelation. So if you are confused by verses 10 and 11, you're in good company. Uh, none of us has uh, a thorough grasp on exactly what this refers to. So if you hear of someone preaching and teaching through Revelation and they seem to be dogmatic, they know exactly what John is referring to here, uh, then you, you may want to be weary. Uh, you, you, you may want to uh, be leery, rather, uh, because we need to approach these verses with a good dose of humility. We're all trying to figure out the best we can exactly what verses 10 and 11 are referring to. So there are differing views on what these verses are meant to represent and how this imagery is uh, to be understood. Some see the seven kings of verse 10 as referring to seven Roman emperors. Others see them as referring to seven specific empires that have arisen in world history. I don't find either of those views very convincing because they both run into problems at some point with their chronology, trying to figure out how chronologically this all fits. I think, personally, I think the best way to understand these verses is to see them like so much else in Revelation uh, as referring to something symbolically. I think we are to understand these verses symbolically. Seven is a number we've seen used over and over in Revelation to point symbolically to completion or to totality. So I think the seven kings is simply pointing to the totality 
of human history and all the different rulers and all the different governments that arise throughout human history that stand opposed to God and to his people. So I think that's what the seven kings is referring to. And of course, there have been many of those rulers and kingdoms and governments that have arisen against God and his people throughout history. Not just a literal seven, many more than a literal seven. So I think the five that he mentions that have already fallen is just a reference to the fact that the beast has already been embodied in these rulers and empires in the past, in places like Egypt and Assyria and Babylon. And the one who is, I think, is referring to Rome. So the one who is right now, at least when John is writing that, is Rome. But of course, Rome won't be the last. That's why he says there will be another that arises. And of course, that other has been embodied in all different, all sorts of different nations and empires since the fall of Rome. Then the reason verse 11 says that the beast is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, is likely a reference to the last and final embodiment of the beast, which will come at the end in the person of the Antichrist. He will be the very embodiment of evil, and he will be different than all the others. And yet, he will be in the same vein as the seven. That's why he's called an eighth, but he belongs to the seven. So then look at what we read in verses 12 and 13. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power. But they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are of one mind and hand over their power and authority to the beast. Now again, I I don't think we ought to take the number ten literally, but symbolically it stands for totality. And therefore we are to see the totality of the kings of the world, all the kings and rulers of the world are going to unite with the beast. They are going to be given uh, authority at the end for a brief period of time, and they're going to willingly give their authority over to the beast. They're going to all join forces together at the end so that they can then all go to war against God. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, it should. This is exactly what we saw last week happening with the pouring out of the sixth bowl. The nations of the world all join forces together and they go to war against the Lamb, which is what we read, uh, which is what we see happening in verse 14. They will make war on the Lamb and the Lamb will conquer them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. So they will all join forces. They will all go against the Lamb to make war against the Lamb, and we're told that the Lamb will conquer them. He will defeat them because He is King of kings and He is Lord of lords, and therefore the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. No matter how often the beast arises, there is coming a day when he will arise no more. He will rise one last time from the bottomless pit, but he will go to destruction when the Lamb fully and finally defeats him. And brothers and sisters, did you notice the way that we, the people of the Lamb, are described there at the end of verse 14. Those with him, that is, those with the Lamb, with the Lord of Lords and with the King of Kings, his people, are called and chosen and faithful. Called, chosen, and faithful. That's a pretty good description of a Christian. It emphasizes both the divine sovereignty and the human responsibility that are involved in our Christian lives. God 
in His grace and in His sovereignty, calls us. He chooses us. He sets His electing love on us. He takes the initiative. He comes to us. He seeks us out. We were walking in darkness, and He calls us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. We, like sheep, were lost and wandering and straying, but our good shepherd called us home. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God called us from death to life, just like He called Lazarus forth, for, called Lazarus forth from the tomb. And so we, like Lazarus, come. We, we come in faith. We respond to that call. We, we respond in obedience to that summons. We believe on His name, and we continue living faithfully in obedience to Him. Called, chosen, and faithful. That's who we are as Christians, as people of the land. Friend, I, I wonder if that description fits you. Does that description fit you and your life? And if not, then I, I plead with you, I, I invite you today to respond to the gospel call. Hear the gospel call and respond in faith. Hear the King summoning you. Hear the Lord saying to you, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And trust Him. Trust in Him. Start living faithfully for Him. Don't listen to the siren call of the woman who seeks to entice you with sin. No, listen to the gospel call of God who graciously offers you salvation. Now speaking of the woman, what about her? What about the prostitute? That's where this chapter started. What happens to her? How do we see her at the end of the story? Because remember, before, she was dressed in beauty and luxury and splendor, and she was in league with the beast. But look at what we read in verses 15 through 18. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out His purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw, she is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. She looks quite different now, does she not? She looks very different from the way we saw her before. Once things start to unravel, the beast, and those who had been intoxicated with her, they all turn on her. No more is she dressed in expensive clothing and jewelry. Now she's been stripped bare. She's been exposed. She's been humiliated and ashamed. And the beast devours her. And she is burned up with fire. So friends, be warned. Be warned. She may look appealing, but remember what she has in that cup that she offers you to drink. That cup is full of abominations and impurities and sins. And remember, sin can never deliver on its promises. Never. It only ever leads here. So be warned. 
to be led astray by the beauty and the enticements and the attractions of this fallen world will only end in shame and defeat and destruction and judgment. It is self-defeating. It's self-destructive in the end. Sin and evil always lead to this. So don't be caught up in her lies. Don't be deceived by her. Don't drink what she offers. It is temporary. I don't care how good it looks. It is fleeting. It will not last. See her for who she truly is. See beneath the charm and the outward appearance because appearances can be deceiving. So be warned. If you're going to get in bed with Babylon, this is where it leads. But let me remind you, let me remind you that this isn't the only woman we see at the end of Revelation. And Babylon isn't the only city that we see at the end of Revelation. No, the end of Revelation really is a tale of two women. And it's a tale of two cities. Babylon and the new Jerusalem, the harlot, the prostitute, and the bride. So look with me for just a moment over at chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19. Look at what we read in starting in verse 9. Here's the exact opposite of what we read in chapter 17. So Revelation 19, beginning in verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, Sounds familiar, right? It's exactly the way chapter 17 starts. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. Here is the alternative to Babylon. Here is the alternative to the prostitute, the bride, the wife of the Lamb, the people of God, the church of of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is also seen here as the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God. And she is truly beautiful. She is truly radiant. She is truly majestic. She is truly luxurious. And don't be deceived. She may not always look like much now, but I am telling you, she will be a sight to behold. So friend, the choice is yours. You can belong to the harlot or you can belong to the bride. You can belong to the church or you can belong to the world. You can be at home in the city of man which is destined to be burned up with fire or you can await an eternal inheritance in the city of God. But be warned, be warned, appearances can be deceiving. Don't be captivated by the charm and the beauty of Babylon because her charm is deceptive and her beauty is fleeting. So that's the warning that we're meant to see here in Revelation 17. Second, I want us to see the reminder. The reminder. This chapter also reminds us of something. And it reminds us of a truth that is very important to remember, especially in times of suffering, especially in times of trial and hardship, in times when evil seems to triumph. And that reminder is the fact that our God is absolutely sovereign. He never loses control. His plans and His purposes are 
always carried out. His word is always fulfilled. He is the one who is steering history according to his plans and according to his purposes. And nothing, nothing will thwart his plans and purposes, not even the evil of the beast. Look again at verses 16 and 17. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and they will devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out His purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Now, understand, verse 16 is very clear. They will hate her. They will make her desolate. They will devour her and burn her up. Their hatred will be genuine. They are doing exactly what they want to do. They're not being made to do something against their will. And yet, unbeknownst to them, They will be carrying out God's will. They will be doing exactly what God wants done. Even when evil is doing its worst, God is still sovereignly directing the outcome. Even when evil is doing its worst, God is still sovereignly orchestrating the outcome. Now, remember, the Bible is very clear. God isn't evil, He isn't tempted by evil, and He doesn't tempt anyone with evil. But evil is never outside of His control. Evil is never outside of His sphere of sovereignty. He isn't hampered by it. He isn't obstructed by it in any way. Evil never gets the upper hand on God. He's never surprised by it. He's never caught off guard by it. He never has to react to it. Ultimately, His plans and His purposes are always being carried out. His word is always being fulfilled. So brothers and sisters, be reminded this morning that no matter how much evil may seem to advance in this world, that doesn't for a second mean that our God has lost control. That doesn't for a second mean that our God isn't reigning over it all. That doesn't mean that God's plans and God's purposes are somehow now in jeopardy. And that doesn't mean that God's promises in His words will go unfulfilled. Now, that means that we as Christians should never be defeatist. We should never have a defeatist sort of attitude, no matter how dark the days may get. We, as the people of God, should always have hope and confidence because we know the end of the story. And we know who is overseeing and directing the story, the one who is steering it to its appointed end, our sovereign God. And therefore, we should trust Him. We should trust God. Even when we can't make sense of it all, we should trust Him. We should trust in His power and His wisdom to work against evil and even to work through the evil schemes of men. And we know He can do this because we've seen examples of it time and time again in the Scriptures and in history. And certainly the most prominent illustration, the the clearest example of all, is the cross of Christ. Think about the cross No greater act of evil has ever been committed in the history of the world than the unjust murder of the very Son of God. And yet, those who willfully carried out that evil and wicked plan to put Jesus to death were also carrying out the very plans and purposes of God. 
God was using that evil to bring about his purposes and his sovereign triumph is seen. His purposes are accomplished. His words are fulfilled when Jesus rises from the dead victoriously because God writes the history of the world. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And His purposes will be carried out. His words will be fulfilled. So brothers and sisters, let's keep that truth in mind. Let's remember that we have every reason to trust God. So see this reminder this morning of His sovereignty, of His power, and of His wisdom, and have faith in your God. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and He knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of His children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God in your pain and in your sorrow. His heart is touched with your grief and despair. Cast all your cares and your burdens upon Him and leave them there. Oh, leave them there. Have faith in God though all else fail about you. Have faith in God. He provides for His own. He cannot fail though all kingdoms shall perish. He rules, He reigns upon His throne. So have faith in God. He is on His throne. Have faith in God. He watches over His own. He must prevail. He cannot fail. Have faith in God. Have faith.
in God. 